Okay, so my name is Jim Fisher, and Will is over here. He's my colleague who will be doing the second half of the talk. We're going to be talking about Go's real-time garbage collector. So as I say, the talk format is I will be talking for about 15 minutes about Go's garbage collector in theory, and then I'll hand over to Will, who will be talking about our experience of Go's garbage collector in practice. And then, if we have time, I don't think we will, we'll try to hand over for first some questions. OK, but backing up, why are Will and I talking about Go's garbage collector? Well, this is our <coughs> backstory. We work at a company called Pusher, which essentially is a big message bus. Uh, so you can see a picture here of what that looks like. We have our customers here who want to send messages. Over here, we have their clients who they're sending messages to, and they all flow through our big service in the middle. So last year, in 2016, we embarked on a project to sort of rewrite the core of this system, of adding some states and caching some of these messages. And we decided to do that in Haskell, which did have many advantages, but Several months after we wrote it, we got to performance testing it. And here's what we found. It's probably not immediately obvious from this screenshot what this means, but it was bad news for our project. It's a screenshot of a program called Threadscope, which shows you, or visualizes one run of a Haskell program. So we've got time from left to right here. And I've annotated this with these very small pink lines which are marking where our system is sending messages. And the key point here is that they're sort of bunched up. So we have kind of periods like here and here where our system is sending messages at a high rate. But we've also got these kind of gaps here, 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 where our system wasn't sending any messages. And that's kind of bad news for us and for our customers because our customers pay us to send messages quickly, and in these periods, those messages are getting delayed, adding latency to them. So why was that? Well, the answer is also in this screenshot. I don't know if you can see it, but there's some little orange blobs in these gaps, which exactly correspond to the gaps. And what they are are garbage collection runs. So what's happening in Haskell is the garbage collector is running, stopping everything else, and adding latency to those messages that we send. So, what is that garbage collection? And how do we stop it from pausing our program? I'm pointing out these orange blobs in case you can't see them. So let's all get on the same page here. What actually is this garbage collection? Well, at a high level, what your program does, whether it's Haskell or Go or pretty much any other mainstream language, is it can do two things. It can create objects, and it can move pointers around between those. So I switch to Go from Haskell here. So this is the kind of syntax you'd use in Go. So you can kind of take the address of an object literal, and that creates a new object on the heap. You can also change pointers, so you can take the address of an object and you can assign that to a field in some other object. And what you're doing there is creating something which looks like this. So you have your process, which has some references to objects. Those objects have references to other objects. So here are these circles, which I'll kind of use throughout to explain this algorithm, are objects, and the arrows between those are pointers. Now, what happens by creating this graph of objects is you create ones like these ones, which the process can't actually see anymore. It can't find those via any chain of pointers. So they are useless, they're garbage, they're taking up memory, and you want to get rid of them. That's what your garbage collector does. So how do we do that? How do we clean up that garbage? Well. There are many ways to do it. I'm going to show you one way to do it called mark and sweep, which 
I'm showing to you for a couple of reasons. Uh, firstly, it's sort of the classic uh, algorithm for garbage collection. Uh, and secondly, it's sort of the, pre the precursor to understanding how Go's garbage collector works. So how does mark and sweep work? Well, it works like this. So you have forever do these three things. First, run your program for a while. Then you stop it and go into this second phase, mark. So you mark the objects which are accessible. So you trace out from your process, looking at all the objects that are accessible, and then marking those. Then you go to your third phase, which is sweeping, where you traverse everything in this entire heap and sweep away the ones that are not marked. And then you continue running your program. The kind of interesting step here is this mark phase. So how does this mark phase work? The way that the mark phase works is to assign each of the objects in your sort of graph of objects to one of three sets which I'm calling black, gray, and white. And I've illustrated this in the example. So we have this black set in the middle here, which has this object. You have this gray set, which is surrounding that, which has three objects in here. And everything else, the stuff on the outside, that's in the white set. And what Mark and Sweep does is to repeatedly take an object from this gray set and scan it for any new objects, move the object that it scanned into the black set, and move the objects that it found into this gray set. So here's a little illustration of that. So here we took this object from the gray set, we marked it black, and we scanned it, found this object here, and pulled that into the gray set. And we do that repeatedly. So here we did it with this object here, then we do it with this object up here, finally this object here, and at this point, there are no more objects left in your gray set. And so the mark phase is done. What this means at this point is that everything in your black set is the objects that are accessible that you want to keep. Everything that's left in the white set is garbage. You want to sweep that away. And so you go to your sweep phase and sweep everything else away. All right, so Mark and Sweep has one big thing going for it, which is that it is simple. I was able to explain this in a few minutes. If you compare it to other garbage collection algorithms, they can be much more complex. It has one big downside, at least at Pusher, which is these pauses to your program. So you have this run, mark, sweep, run, mark, sweep. And during these mark and sweep phases, nothing is happening that's useful to your end user. You're adding latency to the things that they want to do. So at Pusher, at least, that was an unacceptable uh, property of mark and sweep. It turns out that there are all kinds of things that you might want from a garbage collector. So as I say, you might want it to be simple. You might want it to not pause your program. You might want it to be kind of parallelizable. You might want it to be very predictable in its behavior. You might want things like, you might want it to com compact your heap into one area of memory. Uh, you might want it to not have to traverse your entire heap. There are all kinds of things that you might want from your garbage collector, and in short, you can't have them all. There are trade-offs involved. Mm -hmm. The most important trade-off that we had at Pusher was between two things. Low latency, which I've mentioned, and high throughput. So in our message bus, what that roughly means is low latency is the amount of time that it takes us to send a message and high throughput means something like messages per second. And garbage collectors 
kind of trade off one against the other here. I'll show you later an example of why there is this trade off, but like ideal garbage collectors kind of sit on this green line here, making some compromise between the two. And it turned out that Haskell was actually optimized kind of explicitly for high throughput. It was very good at that. On average, we could send many messages per second. But what we actually wanted to optimize for in our job was more along the uh, low latency metric. We cared more about the very small amount of time that it takes for a message to go through our system. I've kind of marked some other things on this diagram. Um, one that might be interesting is this one up here. I've said that Python can kind of give you both. Uh, there are other languages that can also kind of give you both, but they sort of cheat. So what they're doing is using uh, an approach called reference counting, uh, which basically means that you mark each object with a counter which tells you how many references there are to it, and you do your collection as you go running your program. That means that you never pause, and it's also fairly lightweight, so you can get quite high throughput. It does have a significant advantage, which is that it doesn't actually do garbage collection necessarily. It can leak objects. Specifically, when you create cycles of objects, reference counting can't detect that. So we discarded that option. So let's look at Go now. How does it achieve this point in space, this low latency optimization? Well, the way it does it is by taking that algorithm that I've already showed you, mark and sweep, and running that concurrently. So instead of having this step change between run, mark, sweep, and so on, what you have is constantly running your program and in well, concurrently with that, you have under the hood this mark sweep phase running. So, how do you do that? Because it kind of seems tricky thinking about how you can actually run these things concurrently. Like, it seems like it's going to screw up, right? Because you're going to be moving this graph around while you're also marking and sweeping it. Well, the answer to how Go does this is something called the tricolor algorithm. So how does the tricolor algorithm work? Well, to explain how the tricolor algorithm works, we really have to think about why normal mark and sweep works. And it works by maintaining one key invariant, which is that you do not have any pointers from your inner black set to objects in this outer white set. So this red pointer here is an example of something that would not happen under mark and sweep. And that's, this invariant is important because it means once you have taken everything from your gray set, you know that all of your accessible things are in this black set and everything in your white set is inaccessible from that black set. So what we need to do in order to run uh, mark and sweep concurrently is to maintain this invariant even while you're moving this object graph around. If you were to just do this naively, running mark and sweep concurrently with your program, your process can break that invariant that I just explained. So here are some examples of how your program can break that invariant. So it can do two things. It can create objects, and it can move pointers around between those. So for example, if it were to create this object here, which has a pointer in it to this object out here, it has broken the invariant because you have this pointer here crossing this gray boundary set pointing from the black set to the white set, it has broken the invariant. If your process were to create an object and this object went here, again, you will have broken your invariant because you have that pointer across this gray boundary. 
Your process can also move pointers around. Here's one example of that. So if there were a pointer from here to here, and your process decided to move it to instead point up here, again, your process has broken that invariant because you have that new pointer which is crossing this gray boundary. How do we stop the process doing that? Well, the answer is that we take all of those example cases where the invariant can break, and in each of those cases, we fix it. So let's look at each of those cases. So the first case, your program can create new objects. So the natural question in terms of these three sets of objects is where should that new object go? And you can kind of go just by process of elimination. You can't put your object in the white set out here because you immediately have a pointer from your process in the black set to the white set. Nor can you put this new object in the black set because your new object can potentially contain pointers to other objects which can be in the white set. So by process of elimination, try the gray set. Turns out that works. If you put things in the gray set, you will maintain your invariant. And intuitively, the reason for that is that the invariant applies to your black and white sets and not the gray set. So by leaving those black and white sets alone, you are maintaining that. OK, number two, your process can move pointers around. So what should we do when your process moves pointers around? Here's one example. So here, the process decided to take this pointer, which is along here, and instead make it point to here. And it has broken that invariant. So what should we do about that? Well, the answer is similar to last time. And there are actually multiple ways to do this, but this is one way. You color the pointy, the object that is being pointed to, gray. And this sort of works intuitively for the same reason as before, that you are moving objects into this gray set out of the two sets which the invariant applies to. You might be wondering how Go actually detects when pointer moves occur. So if you're thinking about things in like a C or C++ mode where uh, pointers are basically just addresses that you can do whatever you like with, um, well, it can't work in that situation. Go is much more structured about how it deals with pointers. It knows when you are manipulating pointers, and so at each point in your program where your program can manipulate pointers, Go compiles in something called a write barrier or memory barrier, which is a little bit of code that runs, that checks the color of these objects and colors them appropriately in the way that I explained. The reason I mention this is that I think it's a nice example of this trade-off between uh, low latency and high throughput. So because we wanted to run this algorithm concurrently, we have to pr pay the price of this memory barrier to keep things safe. And that kind of trades off some throughput. Another thing you might have noticed is that, well, it sort of seems like you might be able to leak objects during this process. So in this example, we have marked this object here already as black, as not garbage. And yet the process, because it's running concurrently, can come along and turn that object into garbage. So it can change this pointer to instead move here. This object, which has already been marked as not garbage, suddenly becomes garbage. So does that object get leaked? Well, the answer is no. What will happen is that those objects will get collected in the next cycle of your GC. So the guarantee that this algorithm makes is that all objects will be collected within two garbage collection runs of the time that it becomes garbage.
And in terms of the theory, that's pretty much it. So the approach that Go takes to give you this nice, low-latency, real-time garbage collector is to take your classic mark-and-sweep algorithm and run that concurrently with your program. The way that it does that is by maintaining that mark-and-sweep invariant by looking at all of the various ways in which your program can break that invariant and for each of those, fixing it. And in theory, what this means is that you can sort of forget about the fact that you have a garbage collector running. Your program is running all the time. You don't have to worry about these pauses, and it's just kind of invisible. So happy days. Is this actually true? Well, now I'll hand over to Will, who will talk about Go's garbage collector in practice, and yeah, whether this stuff is actually true. Uh, yep. Okay. Um, so, hopefully, everyone has an idea now of how garbage goes. Garbage collector works in theory, how it can run concurrently with a process, and then why this leads to short, hopefully short pause time pause times. Um, this sounded really great to us because, like we mentioned earlier, we had this low latency requirement in the worst case. Um, and also, with this real-world real world system that we were building, we wanted this cache of messages, which meant we had a large number of reachable objects at any one moment in time. So the fact that it can run concurrently meant that we should be able to still achieve short pause times. Um, but we wanted to check that this really did uh, meet this latency requirement in practice. So in order to do this, we created a benchmark. Um, we had already implemented this in Haskell, so we wanted to port this to Go and then check whether we really had got an improvement. And the idea of this was that it should be representative of the real-world real world heap usage characteristics of our real-world system, um, which is essentially to have a large number of reachable objects, and to continually be creating garbage, so continually expiring, um, unreferencing the oldest objects. So basically, what this boils down to is a benchmark that just allocates a large array, and then repeatedly writes objects into the cells in the array in a loop. So on the first iteration, it will just write new objects into the array. And I should mention that the, what's important here is you're not writing objects in line in that array, you're actually writing, allocating an object and then updating a pointer to point to that object. So on the second iteration through this array, you're now update, allocating new objects and then updating pointers to those new objects, unreferencing the previous item, which is where we're creating garbage now. So there's, the point here is that there's always work for the garbage collector to do as we're going through this. And this is the benchmarking code. As you can see, it's very simple. Um, you just have a main loop, and then down here we allocate a new object, and then update the pointer in the array to that new object. And all we're doing around here is just timing that operation, and then keeping track of the of the longest pause time, because we what we really care about is the is the worst case here. So we implemented this in Go and Haskell. And we actually blogged about the results that we got from this, which I'll show you shortly. Um, but since then, it's actually been really picked up by the community. And it's now been implemented in 15 different languages, which is really cool. So you can literally just download this repository and run it on your machine and just see what the different results are for all these different languages. So I did this. Um, I got results from a few languages. And I thought it'd be interesting just to see how they comp can compare to each other. So this is what we have here. I think also the reason that this benchmark really resonates with people is that it is just simple. It's easy to compare results between languages because you just get this one number out at the end. You don't get like a latency distribution, which might be interesting depending on what you're doing. But the fact that you do just get this one number out, which is the worst case pause time, means that you can very easily compare results. So just looking at some ones that I find interesting, you have the maximum pause time 
up here. So basically, we'll want to get as low pause times as possible. And as you can see, Go is actually doing really quite well. I previously mentioned that we had this requirement of having latencies below 50 milliseconds, and Go's worst latency was below 10 milliseconds. So we could just stop here, but that's not particularly interesting. I think it's interesting to see how it compares to other languages, why it gets that time that it does. So looking at Haskell, you can see now that this is performing much worse than Go, and that's kind of what we expected because Haskell's garbage collector is a, is a stop the world garbage collector, which means that it pauses the process during an entire garbage collection cycle um, in a similar way to the naive mark and sweep algorithm. Um, and this actually, this graph, this number here doesn't really capture what's so bad about this. And what is so bad about it is that the pause time is proportional to the number of objects in the heap. So if you double the number of objects, then you double the pause time. And that's not necessarily the case with concurrent garbage collectors like Go's because the process still is running interleaved with the garbage collection process. So there's not this, like, not necessarily this linear relationship between the two. I found Java kind of surprising. I'm not an expert on Java actually, but I think it's just interesting to put it here. Um, this is using the G1 collector, which is the garbage, so Java has a number of garbage collectors. The G1 collector is what's recommended for low latency applications. And not only does it have a number of garbage collectors, but they're also highly configurable. There's a number of parameters which you can set, which make them optimize for different requirements, essentially. Um, if you don't set these parameters, then the runtime system tries to figure out what, to, what values to set them to, um, which is handy, but at the same time, it doesn't, it's not magic. It doesn't know what your requirements are, so it might not get them quite right. And it also means that there's this initial warm-up phase when you start the process. And I think this is actually what you're seeing here. So it's, it might be a little bit unfair, because as you run the program for longer, you should start to see that drop off. But the reason I put it there is kind of to show a different trade-off that's being made here. So Java's garbage collector, or number of garbage collectors, are highly configurable, which is great on the one hand, because you can really tailor it to your use case. But on the other hand, um, it means that you really actually have to like, understand how the garbage collector is working and the impact of, of setting all of these parameters. On the other hand, Go is much more opinionated. It explicitly just optimizes for low latency, really. And that's great if that's what you want. Um, it just sets one, there's one parameter which you can tweak, but we just found the default value um, fine for our use case. I found OCaml really interesting. So when I ran these benchmarks, OCaml was actually the best performing. And it just made me wonder, well, how is it so fast? And I did a little bit of digging into how it works. And it turns out it uses the same algorithm as Go. So it uses this tricolor mark and sweep algorithm, which in a similar way lets it run interleaved with the process. Which basically led me to the question, well, why is Go not performing at least as well as OCaml's garbage collector? And that this is particularly true because around this time, the Go team were making, well, basically saying that you shouldn't really be seeing pause times greater than 100 microseconds. And we just saw a pause time that was two orders of magnitude greater than that. So I was kind of curious, well, what's going on? What is happening in the program run while there is this pause? There must be something happening. So there's this really great tool. Some of you might be familiar with it, but it's Go's Trace Visualizer. And it's kind of similar to the Haskell tool that Jim showed earlier, a screenshot of earlier. And it basically visualizes the runtime events over a run of a program. So I'm just going to open it up now. And we'll do a little investigation into what's going on here. So this is actually showing a run of that benchmark. You've got time from left to right. And at the top here, you have the heap size, which, is, which I really like, because you can very clearly see the behavior of this benchmark. So on that initial iteration through the array, you're just allocating, just allocating new objects. So you just see the heap gradually increasing in size. And then at some point, we enter a new phase. And this is where you're overwriting old objects, 
or updating pointers to new objects, creating garbage of the old ones. And this is where you see the heap kind of the maximum side levels off, and occasionally you see the size dip down like that. And that's where the garbage collector is kicking in. Uh, below that, you just have the number of Go routines and threads, which isn't particularly interesting to us because it's just a single threaded program. And below that, what's really interesting is seeing which CPU, what Go routine each CPU is running over the run of the program. So if we zoom, if we zoom in a bit here, okay, it's quite hard to control sometimes. So this, this, uh, what we see here is the main Go routine. So that's the main benchmark Go routine. And over here, where the garbage collector is running. I like this because you can very clearly see those two phases that Jim outlined before. You have the mark phase, which starts here and finishes here. And then following that, you have the sweep phase. You have to zoom in a lot to see this, but it runs in these kind of small increments, and it says sweep there. So basically, what we really want to see in this is a period of time where this main Go routine isn't running for roughly 10 milliseconds. So along here it looks fine, but as we come up to the garbage collector, we can see that it's essentially, so this is really misleading because this is not the main Go routine, even though it's the same color. You probably can't read it there, but it does say uh, it's this background mark worker process. So it's part of the mark phase of the garbage collector, and that's running on all four CPUs um, and followed by this mark termination phase. But if we look at the, the times on the horizontal axis, you can see that from about 86 milliseconds into the run of the program to uh, about 90 milliseconds, which is 14 milliseconds, you can see that the, the main Go routine is blocked from running. And this is basically the cause of that latency that we saw previously. It's a little bit higher because there's extra instrumentation running when you turn on this trace visualizer. So we know what's running, um, what's creating these pauses, but it's not clear why this is happening. Um, so I, re I kind of asked on the Go, Go Nuts mailing list about this. And sorry, I'll just go back to the this. And it turns out there's a couple of bugs, basically, which related to this benchmark. So the first one is actually the problem that I just demonstrated, and it's these idle mark workers, which are those background mark worker processes. And they were running for a full 10 milliseconds, even though there was more work to do for the main Go routine. They should have been yielding to that, yielding control back to the main Go routine. Um, this has actually now been fixed in Go 1.8. There was also another issue which came out of this, and it's, you can't really see it in that visualization, but it was actually to do with the sweep phase. And what happens is, if a Go routine wishes to allocate a new object while the sweep phase is running, it's required to do some sweeping work itself before it can allocate that object. And there's certain circumstances where this process will go on for too long, basically. I'm not going to go into any more details on these, partly because they go over my head. <laughs> um, you can check out the issues yourself if you're interested. Um, but it's mainly just to make this point that achieving short worst case pause times in all possible cases is really tricky. Um, it was pointed out in one of those issues that they're actually more like edge cases because they tend to just affect micro benchmarks like the one we have where you're con continually running at 100% CPU, which if you're writing like a web server, you wouldn't be doing in practice. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit unfair in some ways, but it does just demonstrate this point of how hard it is to cover all these possible cases. I think what it also demonstrated to us is that it's an area that's actively being improved on. So the Go team's really keen to hear about these issues. And as you saw, one of them's already been fixed um, as we were working on this. And the other one is also being actively worked on. So that's obviously something that we really like to see. But basically, going back to the main kind of point of this talk, it's that it's really to point out that garbage collectors do make these trade-offs, and they're not all optimizing for your requirements. So we had this low latency and large number of reachable objects requirement. If we didn't care about latency, then it might well have been the case that Haskell would have been a better choice for us. 
or if we had a large, sorry, a small number of reachable objects, then Haskell also would have been fine. So it's really about uh, understanding what your requirements are, um, understanding the trade-offs that your garbage collector is making. But I think beyond that, it's also worth doing something similar to us and actually checking in practice whether it does meet your requirements by creating a benchmark. Um, as it turned out, for the, the kind of requirements that we had, Go was an excellent fit. There's a couple of minor issues. Even with them, it still met our requirements. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. So um, thank you very much for listening. And there's no time for questions.